Testing. 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 I think this works. Testing. Why am I not seeing this? Testing. Show me the money. Testing. Okay, I think it's working. Yep, it's working. All right, perfect. All righty. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Uh, happy Wednesday, I think it is. Today we got another paper for you guys. Going heavy on the papers recently. This one's called Lima, Less is More for Alignment. This is a uh, paper published in the 18th of May, so relatively recent. I might have just accidentally killed that. A uh, couple different institutions involved here. We got Meta AI, we got Carnegie Mellon University, we got uh, University of Southern California, and then Tel Aviv University. I actually really like this little, uh, the way that they denoted this. This is a little bit unusual. So they, normally you see letters or numbers, right? Like one, two, three, four, and you'll see those little numbers. But here they decided to use actually symbols, like math symbols, like mu, pi, lambda, and tau. So like, I think it looks pretty. Uh, okay, so we've got relatively big group of people here. So hopefully we see some interesting stuff. Large language models are trained in two stages. One, unsupervised pre-training from raw text to learn general purpose representations. So this is the bulk of the training that uh, large language models uh, do. And at this point, usually for this unsupervised pre-training, usually what they're doing is they're doing uh, next token prediction or masked token prediction, where basically they're trying to predict uh, a chunk of some sequence that is part of a huge data set that's basically the entire internet. Uh, okay, and then once you have that large model, it's very good at kind of completing the next token in the sequence, but it's not very useful in terms of being a little helpful assistant, right? Which is the types of products that people want to make with these large language models. So what people have been doing after that is they do this kind of almost like a transfer learning. Uh, here they call it large scale instruction tuning and reinforcement learning. So this is the RLHF that uh, OpenAI talks about to better align end tasks and user preferences. Uh, user preferences there and end tasks. Uh, I don't know, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, we measure the relative importance of these two stages by training LIMA, a 65 billion parameter LAMA language model. So this is probably the same exact 65 billion parameter LAMA that you uh, that you have access to actually. There's a specific GitHub repo where someone uh, created a pull request that leaked all the different uh, Llama models. Everything from the 7 billion parameter one, this 13 billion parameter one, the 30 billion parameter one, and then the 65 billion parameter one. So m a lot of open source models are what they are in secretly is basically this 65 billion parameter Llama model or some model that has been either distilled from that or fine-tuned from that, or maybe perhaps a uh, LoRa on top of that. So they're using the, the same kind of model that most of the open source community here is using. Uh, okay, so they're taking this 65 billion parameter llama and they're fine-tuning it with a standard supervised loss. Okay, so what a standard supervised loss is, is unsupervised versus supervised. Supervised means that the examples that you're putting into your machine learning model at training time have a specific uh, target or have a specific answer, right? So if you think about a classic classification problem, right? Such as ImageNet, for every image, you also have a uh, target. You have, this is an image of a cat. So you feed in the image of the cat and then the network, you know that the network is supposed to say cat. So you can create a supervised loss, which means that you know what the answer is, so you can always basically create a very simple loss that says this is what the answer should have been, and this is what you told me, and whatever the difference is, we're going to push the gradients for that, right? 
Uh, so they're just going to fine tune it with a standard supervised loss on only 1,000 carefully curated prompts and responses. So the magnitude of this is, I think, the important part, is that I think largely what they're going to try to prove in this paper is that you don't need to have a very long and involved uh, fine-tuning and, and RLHF process. That largely, with just a very few, very, very small set of supervised examples, you should be able to basically get pretty good performance. Lima demonstrates remarkably strong performance, learning to follow specific response formats from only a handful of examples in the training data, including complex queries that range from planning trip itineraries to speculating about alternate history. Moreover, model trends, model, the model tends to generalize well to unseen tasks that did not appear in the training data in a controlled human study. Responses from Lima are either equivalent or strictly preferred to GPT-4 in 43% of cases. Uh, they also compared it to Bard and Da Vinci, so this is pretty good too. You know, a lot of times these papers, they benchmark against a bunch of weird open source models that no one's ever heard of. Or in the uh, GPT-4 paper, they only benchmark against GPT-3. In the Bard paper, they only benchmark against an older version of Bard, Palm 1 versus Palm 2. So I like that in this paper, they're going to be benchmarking uh, uh, two really the, the true competitors in the category, which are GPT-4 and BARD. Uh, da Vinci is uh, the code version of GPT, which I think is still accessible via API. Uh, taken together, these results strongly suggest that almost all knowledge in large language models is learned during pre-training and that only limited instruction tuning data is necessary to teach models to produce high quality output. And I think this last sentence here is a really good summary of what they're going to be doing in this paper. And I think it's a very powerful sentence, right? And I think there's a narrative that companies like OpenAI sometimes try to spin where they say that, hey, the actual pre-training on the internet results in a relatively poor model and it's our secret sauce RLHF that's really making it intelligent. But most people in machine learning kind of don't agree with that, I would say, and like they kind of don't feel like that's the case. I don't, I certainly don't feel like that's the case. My intuition is that the model that the power from the model, the intelligence of the model, really the, the true juice is coming from this huge unsupervised pre-training, right? And then the RLHF, if anything, is actually making it a little bit worse. It's actually constraining the output or the quality of the output. And I think that's what this paper is going to largely prove to you is that, or prove to us, is that you don't need this RLHF. You don't need an extensive fine tuning with all this special crap. It's like even with just a very small set of prompts and responses here, they have a thousand. You can pretty much get a model that has all the capabilities of a GPT-4 that has this very complicated RLHF process. <laughs> Finally on time. Welcome to the stream. Uh, language models. Greetings, Hupo. Greetings. Greetings, welcome to the stream. Uh, we're just getting started, but this last sentence here is the most important. They're basically going to show to us that RLHF is bullshit and you don't need to be paying people in Nigeria to uh, create a bunch of weird questions about political ideology stuff, you know. <laughs> you can just train it on 10 examples and it's probably going to work. Language models are pre-trained to predict the next token at incredible scale allowing them to learn general purpose representations that can be transferred to nearly any language understanding or generation task. To enable this transfer, various methods for aligning language models have thus been proposed, primarily focused on instruction tuning over large multi-million example data sets. So alignment is honestly a word that has kind of started to appear. Like this word didn't necessarily exist five years ago, this idea of alignment. Really, we would have just called this transfer learning, right? You would have said, okay, you're you're have this training up here, this giant unsupervised pre-training, and then you're gonna transfer learn it on this new task, right? This new prompt, uh, prompt and response task. But people have started calling it alignment, and that's kind of what the 
the field has decided is the terminology for this, but I just don't like this because it's 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 kind of very uh, anthropomorphic, right? It's like you're not aligning anything. You're just transferring or constraining an already existing model into a new task. So I don't necessarily like this word alignment, but people are starting to use it more and more. Or fine tuning, yeah, fine tuning is another good example of that. Or another type of transfer learning. Over large multi-million example data sets, and more recently, reinforcement learning from human feedback, the good RLHF, uh, collected over millions of interactions with human annotators. Existing alignment methods require significant amounts of compute and specialized data to achieve. However, we demonstrate that given a strong pre-trained language model, remarkably strong performance can be achieved by simply fine-tuning on 1,000 curated training examples. So, you know, <laughs> OpenAI in shambles here uh, because finally they realize that all this effort that they're putting into this RLHF and the human annotators and this kind of like scale AI style situation where you have all these people sitting there clicking on the right answer in some third world country, they're, that's going to disappear. You don't actually need that. We hypothesize that alignment can be a simple process where the model learns the style or format for interacting with users to expose the knowledge and capabilities that we have already acquired during pre-training. To test this hypothesis, we curate 1,000 examples that approximate real user prompts and high-quality responses. We select 750 top questions and answers from community forums. So the scale here is, is what you need to be paying attention to, right? 1,000, 750, 250 examples. All of this is less than 1,000, right? 1,000, a data set of size 1,000 is really small, right? Even for something like a classification problem with a ConvNet, you would want tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, data points. So anything less than a thousand data points is very, very small. Uh, while optimizing for task diversity and emphasizing a uniform response style in the spirit of an AI assistant. Finally, we train Lima, a pre-trained 65 billion parameter Llama model, fine-tuned on this set of 1000 demonstrations. Uh, okay, table one, sources of training and responses and test prompts. The total amount of training data is roughly 750,000 tokens split, exact, split over exactly 1,000 sequences. Okay, so here are a couple different sources that they're going to be using. They have Stack Exchange, STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's kind of an umbrella term for uh, a particular type of uh, education. So it's probably questions related to that. WikiHow, push shift, natural instructions, paper authors. I don't know what push shift is, but it says r dash ask reddit, so probably just kind of generic questions. We compare Lima to state-of-the-art language models and produce acro products across 300 challenging test prompts. In a human preference study, we find that Lima outperforms RLHF trained DaVinci 003 as well as a 65 billion parameter reproduction of Alpaca, which was trained on 52,000 examples. Right, so it's it's outperforming RLHF, and it's also outperforming a uh, much more intense kind of fine-tuning situation where someone uh, fine-tuned on 52,000 examples. While humans typically prefer responses from GPT-4, Claude, and Bard over Lima, this is not always the case. Lima produces equal or preferable responses in 43% and whatever, basically 50-50, repeating the human preference annotations with GPT-4 as the annotator corroborates our findings. Analyzing Lima responses on an absolute scale reveals that 88% meet the prompt requirements and 50 are, are considered excellent. Okay, so a lot of numbers, but basically what they're trying to say is that this giant model that they fine-tuned on a very limited set of examples is basically comparable to uh, already existing models. Ablation experiments reveal vastly diminishing returns when scaling up data quantity without also scaling up prompt diversity alongside major gains when optimizing data quality. In addition, despite having zero dialogue examples, we find that Lima can conduct coherent multi-tier dialogue and that this ability can be dramatically improved. Boo, you have something to say? 
What are you saying? She's here yelling in the background. But now you're in front of the mic, and are you going to yell? Do you want to say something to the stream? Okay. Uh, this ability can be dramatically improved by adding only 30 handcrafted dialogue chains to the training set. The remarkable findings demonstrate the power of pre-training and its relative importance over large-scale instruction tuning. Yeah, so there's a couple different uh, things to think about. So one thing that has always existed is this problem called catastrophic forgetting, right? Catastrophic forgetting. Let me see if I can find a good pick of this. Is, is this what you want? Yeah, so this is kind of a weird looking um, example, but it shows it. So let's say you have a classification task where you're trying to distinguish between uh, these X's and these O's, right? And your model learns this decision boundary, right? And it learns this decision boundary, which is here it looks confusing, but uh, what you're doing when you have a neural net is it's shaping and morphing a uh, surface in a high dimensional space. And then there's a specific basically boundary in that high linear, in that high dimensional space that uh, looks a lot more flat than this. It's just that whenever you project it down into the original space, it looks weird like that. So, <laughs> This is your current data distribution, right? The combination of these two blobs is the data distribution that your model was trained on. And then let's say that you start feeding it a bunch of examples that are part of this new data distribution, right? Learning task two, right? And now, because you've been training it on this new learning task, this task two, uh, the model has now learned a new decision boundary, right? Now it's using this dotted line as the decision boundary. And this dotted line is different. If you were to take the new decision boundary and try to use it to classify the original learning task, it wouldn't work, right? You would have this whole chunk down here that is now misclassified. And this is a problem in any kind of learning-based system where if you start to change the distribution that you're training on, the performance on the original distribution is gonna start to uh, become worse and worse. So when you take this giant model, which has been trained for next token prediction and you fine tune it or RLHF fine tune, which is also pushing gradients into it, it's gonna get better at whatever this RLHF task is or whatever the fine tuning task is, but it's gonna get worse at next token prediction, right? And the reality is that what they're trying to say here with the power of pre-training is that the intelligence is coming from the next token prediction. It's not coming from this RLHF task. So if anything, you're actually making it worse with this RLHF task. So reducing the amount of gradients you, or the amount of kind of gradient updates and the amount of learning iterations uh, after this pre-training task is actually important because you don't wanna be pushing too much crap into there, right? Because the more gradient updates you push, the more your model's gonna forget and forget and forget and forget the original task. So this is the problem known as catastrophic forgetting. Um, and another, I think, important thing to think about here is called dataset distillation. So this is an older piece of work, but I think this is actually, uh, it might not be this exact paper, but people were uh, doing this before where, this is a very old paper at this point, maybe not. I think there's older papers of this, but basically the idea is that you can take a data set like MNIST, right, which has 60,000 images, and basically pick out the 100 images that kind of condense that, and then you train on these 100 images and you get 85% of the MNIST accuracy, right? So people have been doing this for a while, but it's this idea that you can take a much larger data set and then reduce it down into basically this distilled data set and then that distilled data set gives you very, very close to the original accuracy, but on a much smaller data set, right? So you can take MNIST, which is 60K images, distill it into 10 images, and then just train on those 10 images. And now you have a model that's 94% as accurate as the original model trained on the 60K. So 
there's a little bit of those two ideas in this paper, the idea of catastrophic forgetting and then the idea of data set distillation. So you could think of it that way, right? Is there basically uh, data set distillation but applied to the process of fine-tuning a large language model? Uh, okay, let's go. Section two here, alignment data. We define the superficial alignment hypothesis. A model's knowledge and capabilities are learned almost entirely during pre-training. While alignment teaches it which sub-distribution of formats should be used when interacting with users, right? It constrains the original model. If this hypothesis is correct and alignment is largely about learning style, then a corollary of the superficial alignment hypothesis is that one could sufficiently use a tune a pre-trained model with a rather small set of examples. Not, as, not only could you do it, but it's actually preferable. To that end, we collect a data set of 1,000 prompts and responses where the outputs are statistically, stylistically aligned with each other. So stylistically here refers to the fact that they're all kind of in this question answer format that is very common to the uh, LLM assistants. Specifically, we seek outputs in the health st style of a helpful AS AI assistant. We curate such examples from a variety of sources, primarily split into community QA and manually authored examples. We also collect a test set of 300 prompts and a development set of 50. Table one shows an overview of different data sources and provides some statistics. Community questions and answers. So here are the different data sets they use. I don't know much about these data sets, to be honest, the WikiHow or the push shift Reddit data set, but I'm assuming they're already pretty filtered and uh, curated. Uh, can therefore be mined automatically, whereas highly upvoted Reddit answers tend to be humorous or trolling, require more manual approach. Stack Exchange is 179 online communities. It seems like it's probably primarily Stack Overflow. Stack Exchange has successfully maintained a high bar for content quality. I don't know. I would say that a lot of people would argue this and a lot of answers on Stack Overflow. There's kind of a meme where people on Stack Overflow are a little bit mean, you know, and they, they kind of tell you to, to look at the documentation and they don't really answer your question. But I'm sure that this data set, the Stack Exchange, was has been filtered for that. Hi, can I share here two nice papers about diffusion models? Uh Probably not worth sharing it on the actual YouTube chat, but if you want, there's a Discord link in the uh, discussion or in the description of this video, and go ahead and uh, put those links in that Discord if you want. Why do you think smaller instruction tuning data set is preferable? Uh, because of uh, the problem of catastrophic forgetting. When you have a very large, uh, when you're doing this kind of uh, transfer learning, when you're learning, when you push gradients for one task and then you transfer to a new task, every time you push a gradient for that new task, you're getting slightly worse at the original task. So the more uh, training you're doing in this RLHF process or this fine tuning process, the more you're kind of eroding away and getting rid of all the original intelligence that was learned in the original pre-trained task, right? So if you can reduce that fine tuning into either a LoRa style situation where the original model is frozen and then you're just uh, fine and then you're just pushing gradients into a tiny little additional module, or in this case they're going to be pushing gradients to the entire model, but they're going to be doing it for a much smaller amount of iterations and steps. 300 test prompts, isn't that rather small considering the vastness of language? It could be biased. Uh, yes, it's going to be biased, right? That's exactly what you want. At the end of the day, you're, you're, you want it to bias it into this helpful assistant mode, right? So the original pre-trained model is just going to be very good at a million different things, right? You can, you can start produce you can start writing code and it'll autocomplete code you can start writing some weird like uh, reddit thread and it'll autocomplete that reddit thread you can write shakespeare to autocomplete shakespeare but whenever you want to make an llm product right you want it to be this kind of like assistant so you want it to tr basically try to pretend that it's answering a question that you're asking 
So really all you need this fine tuning for and this RLHF is to just put it in that mode, right? Like constrain the output so that the output is always in this kind of like chat prompt answer kind of uh, style. Discord link is not working. Fuck, dude. Damn. <laughs> I'll update it. Uh, I don't know why it keeps doing that. I think they time out. Maybe I need to make a Discord link that uh, doesn't time out. But let me see. I'll fix it at the end of this. Let me see. Uh, create. Create channel? No. I want like a... I'm not gonna. I, I'm not gonna do it now because they're also just gonna distract too much from the stream. Sorry, man. I'll do it afterwards. Uh, 99 other English. We discard five niche examples. We then sample 200 questions and answers using a temperature of three to get a more uniform sample from the different domains. We select the top answer. We automatically filter answers that are too short or too long. Okay, so they're kind of playing within the context window of these LLMs, somewhere between 40,000, or 4,000, sorry. Uh, we also remove links, images, HTML tags. This is all the different data set cleaning that they're doing. I mean, it is the test set. Like, the results of testing could be biased, hence not representative. But anyways, let's see what they got. Yeah. WikiHow is an online wiki style publication of 240,000. So this is basically Wikipedia. 200 articles, how to cook an omelet. The following answer. Okay, apply a number of post processing. So there's a bunch of different post processing that they're doing here, a bunch of data set cleaning. If you notice for each of these, they're doing a bunch of cleaning. So the Reddit data set comes from r ask Reddit, r writing prompts. I'm not, I don't really go to these subreddits to be honest, so I don't really know what they're like, but I assume it's basically people trying to answer questions. To further div diversify our data beyond questions asked by users, we collect prompts from ourselves. We designate two sets of authors to create 250 prompts, each inspired by their own interests or those of their friends. We select 200 prompts from group A for training and 50 prompts as a held out development set. I bet you that they actually use ChatGPT to do that. <laughs> I think if you asked me right now to make 250 prompts, I would probably use an LLM. We supplement the 200 training prompts with high quality answers, which we write ourselves. While authoring answers, we try to set a uniform tone that is helpful for a helpful AI assistant. Many prompts will be answered with some acknowledgement of the question followed by the answer of itself <laughs> so if you guys don't like the fact that llm assistants tend to be like sure let me answer your question and then you should they always say something like the acknowledgement of the question here's here's what you have to blame is that people are actually using that in the rlhf or fine-tuning examples uh it's consistent we hypothesize that it assists the model in forming a chain of thought similar to the less think step-by-step -step prompt. Yeah, one interesting thing that I think I've started noticing and it kind of makes sense is that the longer you interact with the model, the more the model has the ability to look at its own output and look at the prompt and kind of continue to answer, the more intelligent it becomes, which is kind of weird to think about because you could almost think of it like consciousness where you're creating a consciousness whenever you start interacting with an LLM. And then the longer that consciousness is alive, the better the answer is going to be because it has, just has more information, it's thought about more things, the more of its kind of experience is explicit. So, I don't know, that's a little bit of weirdness there, but I feel like there's something to that, you know. Uh, do you believe everything written in this paper? I think a lot of questions specifically, they should explore the scaling law for instruction tuning data. Why did this just close? What the fuck? That's weird. Did you guys see that? It just deleted the fucking thing for some reason. So I haven't read the paper yet, but 
I can answer that question once I'm done reading this paper. Uh, we also include 13 pr training prompts with some degree of toxicity or malevolence. We carefully write responses that partially or fully reject the command and explain why the assistant will not comply. So they give it 13 examples of how to say no. In addition to our manually authored examples, we sample 50 training examples from supernatural instructions. Specifically, we select 50 natural language generation tasks such as summarization, paraphrasing, and style transfer, and pick a single random example from each one. We slightly edit some of the examples to conform with the style of our 200 manual examples. Our intuition is that this small sample adds diversity to the overall mix and can potentially increase model robustness. Manually creating diverse prompts and authorizing, authoring rich responses is laborious. Yep. Which is why you pay people in third world countries to do it, right? <laughs> I, I like the idea of not having these kind of like hardcore RLHF kind of situations where you have to have a bunch of manual labelers. Like the, the whole idea of manual labeling and, and manual annotation is... is very dystopian IMO. This work explores the effect of invest investing in diversity and quality instead. <sighs> Look at that. This is a this is a, a jab at OpenAI right there. The key question for me right now is what the hell is in their training set and test set? So the training set is the original 65 billion parameter llama training set which is basically the whole internet the uh, fine-tuning set or this transfer learning uh, data set is going to be the 1000 kind of examples that they pick so it's some combination of these and then some hard hand-coded ones so that's what they were describing here basically these prompt answer uh, style data points of from Stack Exchange, Wikipedia, and then Reddit. Uh, like the training and test set that they collected could be aligned with each other such that it biases the results heavily towards a Lima model. Yeah, it could be the case. It's kind of like, what are they evaluating this on, right? So they say that uh, users prefer uh, Lima over these chat GPT-4, Claude and Bard roughly 50-50% of the time. So like, what exactly are they training it on, right? So they could be kind of biasing it in that way where they pick specifically prompts that are exactly the type of prompts that are going to be in their test data set. But I don't know if they do that. That would, that would, be, that would seem a little bit outrageous. They didn't share the instruction tuning data. Yeah, they didn't share it, but they, they talk about it here. So, I mean, they, they straight up tell you what it is. It's just we supplement the 200 training prompts. So it's like they're just kind of picking prompts. I think the important thing here is not that the 1,000 examples is like there's something magical about these exact 1,000 examples. I think what they're trying to tell you is that you don't need a ton of examples. It's not that these 1,000 examples that they picked are like some kind of magical uh, distillation, right? The 1,000 examples that they picked, it kind of sounds like they're kind of just arbitrary examples that they picked. And you could pick your own 500 examples and then fine-tune on that and get a pretty good result. That's what they're suggesting. Yeah, because one situation is that the 1,000 examples they picked are kind of like this, right? Like the data set distillation idea that I was saying. And in data set distillation paper distilling 60,000 images into 10 images like these images don't even look like numbers anymore right it's like it's like you're feeding the neural net this like weird noise and it's learning from this weird noise but this noise is is the result of a learning process that distills down from these 60,000 images i don't think that's the case here i don't think there these 1000 examples are like these weird like examples that are like just perfectly uh, phrased in such a way to uh fine tune super efficiently i think more the vibe that I'm getting from this and the vibe that I got from the way that they describe these data set or this this these uh this stuff here is that they're like, hey, we just picked a thousand kind of random looking questions and we gave it to it and it did quite well. So I don't think that this is there's there's anything sacred about this. I think more so they're trying to show you that even with just 
1,000 examples, you can get pretty good results. General idea is good, but it must be proven in a clear and transparent way. Yeah, so Kalina, you, you bring up good points, right? Where it's like, they don't even tell you what the 1,000 examples are, right? Ideally, what they would do is they say, hey, we sample 1,000 random examples from this giant data set over here. And we do this with 10 different random samplings of 1,000 examples each, right? So I would have liked to see that kind of uh, ablation study where they're like, hey, we try a bunch of different 1,000 example samples, right? And then see if what each of them gives you, right? Because it could just be the case that they cherry picked this exact 1,000. To differentiate between each speaker, we introduce a special end of turn token. Okay, so you have the end of sentence tokens. Now they have an end of turn token. Uh, this token plays the same role as end of sentence token for halting generation, but avoids conflation with any other meaning that the pre-trained model may have imbued. Okay, so whenever they were pre-training this model on next token completion, it's seen very many end of, se end of sentence or end of sequence tokens, but it has never seen an end of turn token. So they basically don't want the they don't want this token to have any kind of pre-existing kind of notion inside the uh, model's weights. Yeah. We follow standard fine-tuning parameters. We fine-tune for 15 epochs. Why am I doing this in green? This should be... This should be in, I think blue is the color that we use for numbers. 15 epochs with atom. These are the two different atom hyperparameters. Uh, weight decay of 0 0.1. So a weight decay is basically as you train, you your weights erode. So the value, the actual numerical value of your weights is decreasing. And what that what that means is that only the, the neurons and the activations that like are actually doing something uh, grow right and the neurons that are kind of not really adding any signal they just slowly decay over time this is a very aggressive weight decay to be honest point one for something like fine tuning seems very intense uh, we set the initial learning rate to 1e to the negative 5 and linearly decay to 1e to the negative 6 so linear decaying this is a learning rate schedule what that means is that the learning rate that you use at the beginning of your training is different than the learning rate that you use at the end of your training so here they're just starting at a 1e e negative 5 which is a very small learning rate to begin with because you're fine tuning here if you were to start if you were to try to fine tune with a learning rate of 1e e to the negative 1 you would basically within a couple gradient steps you would overwrite all the weights so they don't want to completely erase what was done in pre-training, so they're going to use a very small learning rate to push a couple more examples. Right, so 15 epochs sounds like a lot, but they're only using 1,000 examples, so it's really only 15,000 uh, total uh, data points. The batch size is set to 32 examples, or 64 for smaller models. This is a very small batch size. Makes me wonder what exactly they're training this on. And text longer than 2048 tokens are trimmed. One notable deviation from the norm is the use of residual dropout. Okay, so residual dropout is dropout within residual connections. Uh, residual connections, also called skip connections, are whenever you have a path that the uh, that goes around a block, right? So let's say you have a multi-layer perceptron or something. You can have a path where the input doesn't necessarily need to go through all the layers. It can just skip around and go to the end, right? And residual connections are very good for a variety of reasons, and pretty much any model architecture you see has all these residual connections all over the place. Uh, and here they're doing dropout specifically on that. Uh, the probability of dropout starts at 0, 0.0, which means that there's no dropout at the beginning, and then at the end of the training it starts to 0.3 or it goes to point 0.3, which basically means there's a 30% chance that the individual uh, information going through that residual connection gets removed. And this makes your model uh, more robust because it's kind of like a regularization because it means that your model is able to get the right answer. You want your model to get the right answer even if part of the information is obscured, right? 
because if sometimes what happens if you don't have dropout is that your model just learns to pay attention to only the most important thing and it kind of ignores everything else so by adding dropout you force it to kind of pay attention to more things right because sometimes some of those things might not be there uh, we find that perplexity does not correlate with generation quality perplexity is a metric that a lot of people use to judge uh, the quality of LLMs and I've never liked these kind of metrics so I'm glad that here you have a good someone finally saying that hey perplexity is not necessarily a good measure of quality right like in in computer vision world I, I for example hate uh, for inception distance FID or inception score I just feel like those are kind of just bogus and in natural language there's kind of the equivalent type of thing right perplexity and I just I've never liked things like that. I feel like these kind of like quantifiable, these metrics like that, they just don't actually give you a good idea of what is good and what is not. Uh, we manually select checkpoints between the fifth and the tenth epochs using the held out 50 example development set. Okay, so this is the actual, the held out set is, you could think of this like the validation set. So in, in machine learning, you have your training set you have your validation set and then you have your test set. So generally what you're doing is you're training on your test on your training set and then occasionally during training you will uh, evaluate on your validation set and that lets you know how the performance is actually doing, right? How how good is your loss actually going down? Is your accuracy actually increasing? And then once you're done doing the training and uh, evaluating on the validation set, then at the very very end you'll evaluate on your test set. So here, uh, they're selecting checkpoints, which means that they're, the model is saved at the 5th epoch and the 10th epoch, whether or not based on basically the performance on this validation set of 50 examples. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry, Kalina, I've been like, uh, would pick a subset of the open system data set, fine tune on it using the same procedure, and then show it performs better. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, what would be a great way to that would be a great way to prove their point what if instead of decay which looks like this we would do this w minus zero w minus w under zero so yeah it kind of sounds like what you're describing yeah you're almost describing uh, EMA exponential moving average exponential moving average for distributed training. So this is something that uh, is popular in reinforcement learning when you have these distributed training setups where basically you you push gradients to different versions of the model and then you take the average of all the weights, right? So that's another form of kind of regularization on the actual weights. It's not, it's not the same thing as uh, weight decay, but it's kind of in the same spirit where it's like you, you're kind of like... Uh, averaging in weight space or subtracting in weight space or reducing the individual values of the weight. So there's a lot of different techniques for regularization on the weights themselves, but I don't know. I just thought that this was kind of an aggressive weight decay, right? Especially for something like a fine tuning. Uh, we evaluate, and actually, sorry, sorry to kind of continue to digress here, but an interesting thing to think about with weight decay is actually, I think the human brain does this too, right? And you actually have a lot more neural connections when you're a little kid than when you're older. And actually when you're older, a lot of times what's happening is you actually are reducing the amount of neural connections, right? It's like you're pruning your brain. You're, you're weight decaying inside your own head. Your brain is itself weight decaying as you get older and older. And it's, and it's, it, it sounds weird, right? It sounds weird that your brain reduces the amount of connections and you tend to get older as you get smarter, but that's just the way that intelligence works, right? Where sometimes having too many connections, having too many weights that have too many values that are too high is actually not good. And really what you want to do is kind of decay those weights, decay those connections over time, and you end up getting kind of more intelligence out of that. So maybe there's a little bit of that going through, going uh, into this as well. My intuition is that W minus W naught would help avoid catastrophic forgetting. Yeah. 
I mean, another way to avoid catastrophic forgetting is just do like a LoRa, right? Like don't freeze the actual original model and then just train and push gradients on these additional little modules, right? Uh, you guys should check out the LoRa paper if you haven't seen it. We reviewed it on this channel, uh, LoRa model weights. But in LoRa, you're basically, you add like this little extra matrix right like this you're adding this little yellow part and then you're freezing the rest of it so if this pink thing here is the pre-trained llama model you're just adding a little extra set of weights and then fine-tuning those right so you actually keep all of the original weights so that's not what they're doing here here they're actually changing the pink weights right they don't they, the model is exactly the same they're just pushing a couple a couple more gradients into these pink weights Uh, we evaluate Lima by comparing it to state-of-the-art language models and find that it outperforms OpenAI's and uh, Alpaca. I think Alpaca is a Stanford paper where they trained a Llama model on 52,000 examples that came from uh, ChatGPT. So in a sense, Lima is actually basically Alpaca, but rather than 52,000 examples, it's uh, 1,000 examples, so it's an order of magnitude less examples. The fact that simple fine-tuning over so few examples is enough to strongly to compete with state-of-the-art strongly supports the superficial alignment hypothesis as it demonstrates the power of pre-training and its relative importance over large-scale instruction tuning and reinforcement learning approaches. I agree with that. That's the like seventh time they, they say this sentence, and we're probably going to read this sentence another ten times as we go through this paper, but I feel like that's really, this intuition is very powerful, and I feel like if there's one thing you take out of this stream, it's this. It's that the majority of the intelligence, the majority of the power, the majority of the juice is coming from this pre-training task, right? Uh, Jan LeCun, cake. This is a very famous uh, slide and it's become a meme, but Jan LeCun, who is the head of AI at Facebook, he's kind of, uh, he originally, he came up with ConvNets or like he was involved in ConvNets, but he was doing deep learning like decades ago, but he made a very good point. Uh, I think this was years ago, 2019, yeah, where he basically said, if you think of a final kind of AI system 10 years from now, the overwhelming majority of the learning is coming from this self self supervised learning right the actual cake right the cake and the icing the supervised learning is not uh i would say this has kind of disappeared now it's mostly just self supervised learning or unsupervised learning that would be the meat of the cake and then the actual the only the cherry on top is the rlhf the reinforcement learning or this uh, fine tuning right so most of your intelligence is really just coming from or most of the bulk of the cake is coming from self-supervised or unsupervised learning. Uh, to compare Lima, we generate single responses. We then ask crowd workers. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so earlier here, they 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 kind of shat on OpenAI a little bit, saying, uh, "Hey, like you don't want to be." Uh, we compare Lima to five baselines. Here are the different baselines. You have Alpaca 65B. You have, that's not the right color. I want this color. Uh, and it's actually their own version of this. We fine tune a 65B Llama on the 52,000 examples in the training set for Alpaca. They're going to compare to OpenAI's DaVinci 003, which has been tuned with RLHF. They're going to compare to Google's BARD, which is based on Palm, and we don't really know what the fuck Google's Bard has been trained on or how it's been fine-tuned or anything like that, unfortunately. And Anthropic's Claude, which is the famous for its 100K contacts, but trained with reinforcement learning from AI feedback, constitutional AI. Okay, so we also don't really exactly know what Claude has been trained on either. Uh, they train, they compare to GPT-4 and currently considered state-of-the-art. Is GPT-4 the state-of-the-art? I think it is. It still is, maybe. Responses from all baselines were sampled. 
For each prompt, we generate a single response from each base baseline model using nucleus sampling with p equals 0 0.9 and a temperature of t equals 0 0.7. Comparing five black boxes against alpaca, yeah, basically. <laughs> We apply a repetition penalty of previously generated tokens with a hyperparameter of 1.2. We limit the maximum token length to 2048. Um, so this is there's different sampling strategies. Like if you guys use the OpenAI API, you might be aware of this temperature parameter, and then there's other parameters like top K. There's there's different ways of picking the answer from an LLM, right? At the end of the day, what the LLM is giving you is a probability distribution over all possible tokens, and which token you end up picking at every single given point in time. You could just pick the the maximum one every time. That's called greedy sampling, but nucleus sampling is a, a little bit more uh, stable, I guess. But there's also a bunch of different types of sampling, so it's also important to realize is that. This all of this could not could work could you could get completely different results if you use a different type of sampling. Um, okay, but let's look at what they got here. We got Figure One human preference evaluation, and then Figure Two preference using GPT-4. So this is what humans prefer, and this is what GPT-4 prefers. Uh, okay, so I guess what they do is they give the model a question. The model answers the question, and then basically the human says, "Which one do you like better? Do you like?" Uh, answer A, B, C, D, or E, right? And then they ask the same thing to GPT-4. Which one do you like better, A, B, C, D, or E? And I'm pretty sure it's probably double blind. The model does not know which model was used to uh, generate the exact answer, and the human didn't, doesn't know either. So, uh, it still seems like uh, GPT-4 and Claude are kind of state of the art, right? If you see most of the time, the human prefers the answer from these, right? And the the model also prefers. It's interesting that the model prefers it at a higher rate than the human. Um, and then, honestly, Lima doesn't necessarily do super well. The, it only really does well against Alpaca 65B. And even with DaVinci 003, it's kind of on par, but like with these uh, big models here, like Bard, Claude, and GPT-4, which are also the most black box models, to be honest, it does the worst. So this paper would have been, would have hit differently if these charts showed a different story, right? Imagine if these charts showed that uh, people and GPT-4 very much preferred the Lima then this paper would be absolutely massive, right? Because it, then at that point, it would mean that RLHF is actually bad and you should get rid of it as soon as possible. But looking at these charts, it still seems like RLHF is, is a little bit better than uh, fine-tuning on just a thousand examples. But really what they're showing you here and what I'm reading from here is that fine-tuning on a thousand examples is pretty much just as good as fine-tuning on 50,000 examples. So really what it's beating out is this alpaca 65b which is a 65 billion parameter llama fine-tuned on 52,000 examples uh, at each step we present annotators with a single prompt and two possible responses generated by different models the annotators were asked to label which response was better or which neither response was better than the other appendix c provides exact phrasing RLHF is not about following instructions. It's also about factual accuracy. Kind of, but what is a fact? You know, like, I think that's important to consider too. It's like when you're taking a large pre-trained language model and you're fine and you're using RLHF to push it into a specific uh, situation, into a specific style, you might actually make it less factual as well. Yeah, like the, like if you remember, we were using uh, Bard and ChatGPT, and we were doing things like uh, we ask it a question, a math question, and then we, we we pretend that it's getting the math question wrong, right? We say like that's not the right idea, and then because it doesn't want to be uh, kind of antithetical to you, it'll be like, oh, you're correct, you're correct, I did the wrong thing. Here's what you really wanted to say, right? But so I don't think there's a making a model more helpful and more of an assistant doesn't necessarily make it more factual. I think that those are 
not necessarily uh, in the same direction, which is something to think about. Uh, I was writing my graduation thesis using all the available models. Yeah, I think that's the best practice. Right now, the best thing you can do is if you're using any kind of LLM, use all of the LLMs and then take kind of the average of all of their answers. Inter-annotator agreement. We compute inter-annotator agreement using tie discounted accuracy. We assign one point if both annotators agree, half a point if either annotator Okay, so they, this is some kind of like score that they're going to come up with to determine how good the preference is. Crowd to crowd, crowd author, author, author. Some degree of subjectivity. And we also measure the agreement between GPT-4 and humans. Crowd GPT, author GPT. <laughs> essentially passing the turking test. <laughs> this is the uh, the lesser known example of the uh, Turing test. Uh, GPT-4 almost never does that. I wonder what OpenAI did to make their model so honest and accurate in that regard. Yeah, we don't know, right? We don't know what kind of, uh, what their RLHF process looks like. Uh, figure 1 shows the result of our human preference study, while Figure 2 displays the result of GPT-4 preferences. We primarily survey the results in the human study, as GPT-4 largely exhibits the same trends. Our first observation is the fact that train, despite training on 52 times more data, Alpaca 65B tends to produce less preferable outputs than Lima. Yeah, so this is the biggest uh, kind of flex of the paper, right, is that largely kind of you can almost look at this paper as basically the alpaca paper but on 10 times less data through a lesser extent what is striking is the fact that was trained on rlhf a supposed supposedly superior alignment method <laughs> shots fired bard shows the opposite trend producing better responses however it also means that 58 percent of the time lima response was at least as good as bard Finally, see, we see that while Claude and GPT-4 generally perform better, there is a non-trivial amount of cases where Lima does actually produce better responses. Even GPT-4 prefers Lima outputs 90% of the time. I, I feel like this kind of preference situation maybe is a little bit misleading because I think it's like a more... You, you want to be... Like, if the answers are close, that's a better... You know what I'm saying? Like, how much better was it, right? Did Lima barely win or did Lima completely dominate, right? That's the more important question. Like, how much worse is the Lima answer than the GPT-4 answer in this 19%? How much uh, better is the Lima answer to the GPT-4 answer? It's like, I want the, like, almost like a more, some kind of metric that makes it more obvious whether the answers were already kind of similar or whether one answer was significantly better than the other one. That would have been, I would have preferred that kind of metric. On one of their presentations, the RLHF engineer says they check consistency, generate five answers if a model generates different facts, train it to say, I don't know. Yeah, I think that also like alignment and the field of alignment, I feel like right now it's, a little bit about uh, fine tuning and LoRa tuning and RLHF, but to me, alignment is almost better done as a post-processing task. I feel like when I think about the future systems of the, like 10 years from now, I feel like you're just gonna be using raw pre-trained models and then you're gonna have this kind of complicated kind of tree of answers system that sits on top of it, right? So you're basically getting the raw answer from the pre-trained model, and then you have these different models that evaluate the different answers and then kind of filter them through all these different filters. So I think that to me, the alignment can almost be done entirely in the post-processing and doesn't need to be uh, this kind of fine-tuning task. I don't feel like that's necessarily the right way to, to do alignment. While our main evaluation assesses Lima with respect to state-of-the-art models, one must remember that some of these baselines are actually highly tuned products that must have been exposed to millions of real user prompts during training. So they don't know is basically what they're saying. 
We thus provide an absolute assessment of the manually annotating 50 random examples. We label each example into one of three categories. 50% of Lima answers are considered excellent and that is able to follow all but six of the 50 analyzed prompts. We do not observe any notable trend within the failure cases. Okay, so this is kind of more what I was saying where I want to know how good or how bad the actual response is, not whether or not it's slightly better or slightly worse than the GPT-4 answer. So here they're telling us that 50% of the time you actually get a very good answer and then only 12% of the time do you get a terrible answer. Outs of distribution, 50, 43 are somewhat related. We analyze 13 additional out of distribution examples and find that 20% of the responses fail. So obviously if you have an out of distribution, you're gonna get a higher failure rate. Lima's action when asked to stand up or order pizza. Mm. It might prefer its own distribution, yeah. That might be what's going on here, right? G the GPT-4 prefers itself more than uh, humans prefer it. I think that's because GPT-4 is probably looking at things that we don't even look about, look at, right? Like one thing that people don't think about is that like the style is probably more important to the LLM than we think it is, right? Like when I ask a question, it's like, R, what be ye favorite color, right? The model's going to respond and kind of pirate themes, right? And a human person might be looking at this answer and they're just trying to, to, they're looking at this answer and they're like, oh, this answer is garbage because it doesn't actually answer the question of what's his favorite color. But a LLM might look at this and be like, oh, this person said something in a pirate theme and this is a pirate theme. So therefore this is a good answer, right? So the, the language model might be evaluating different things and making that judgment based on different things that we might not even recognize as a human, right? Like the, the spacing of the tokens, the use of specific tokens. It's something to think about, right? It's like, it's not, it's not paying attention to the same things that humans are. We analyze the effect of having a small number of safety related examples, 30 potentially sensitive prompts. Uh, Lima responds safely to about 80% of them, including six out of 10 prompts with malicious intent. Lima is more likely to provide unsafe responses. Why is less more? Ablations on data diversity, quality, and quantity. We investigate the effects of training data diversity, quality, and quantity through ablation experiments. We observe that for the purposes of alignment, scaling up input diversity and output quality have measurable positive effects, while scaling up quantity alone might not. Why is this like highlighting not working well? Uh, we fine tune a 77 billion parameter llama model. So this is the tiniest llama model, the 7B1 on various data sets controlling for the same hyperparameters. We then sample five responses and evaluate the response quality by asking GPT 3.5 Turbo to grade the helpfulness. Is GPT 3.5 Turbo going to give you a good answer? I don't know. On a one to six Likert scale, so I guess rate from one to six, we report the average score along with a P0.95 two-sided confidence interval. So, uh, this is a pretty standard uh, correlation kind of uh, confidence that people use in scientific papers, but it's also not necessarily super strong. So uh, is there any implication that we need less fine tuning now? Can you tell me your guess about how much A100 time it would take after this paper? So. It depends on what you want to do. I think that if you want to recreate uh, alpaca, this paper is basically telling you that you can recreate alpaca with 10 times less data. But if you want to create a model that does something different, I still feel like you can fine tune on your own data set, right? But I would not necessarily do it like this. I would use a LoRa. And the reason I would use a LoRa is not because you're training less weights, but because it's actually less, 
like loading a 65 billion parameter uh llama model onto your fucking gpu and and having all the layer norms all the batch norms all the like gradients that's not going to fit in your gpu you know like the, the reason you can't fine tune a llama like the entire llama right like uh the reason you can't fine tune the pink weights is because like fitting them on your GPU and training and pushing gradients into these pink weights is significantly more intense. And it's going to take significantly more memory than just pushing weights into this little yellow thing. So I feel like this is really only important if you're either training a very small model, like a seven B parameter llama, or you have a very large distributed training setup where you can push gradients for a 65 billion parameter model. Uh, hope that answered your question, Rooster's Lab. Yeah. To test the effects of prompt diversity, uh, open source is going to be competitive until they uh, make training your own models illegal. <laughs> Just wait for that one, Kalina. People, you're gonna you're gonna go to jail uh, because you uh, pushed some gradients into a 65 billion llama parameter. They're gonna show up to your house and be like, "Where's the GPU? Where is the GPU?" and then rip the GPU out of your computer and put you in jail. To test the effects of prompt diversity while controlling for quality and quantity, we compared the effect of training on quality filtered stack exchange data, which has heterogeneous prompt with excellent responses, and WikiHow, which has homogeneous prompts with excellent responses. Uh, heterogeneous just means different, and then homogeneous just means the same. Uh, we acknowledge that there may be other conflating factors when sampling data. We sample 2,000 training examples from each source, and figure 5 yields significantly higher performance. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, w wait a second. Here they're saying scaling up the quantity alone does not. And I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. You took your 1,000, you turned it into 2,000, and you got significantly higher performance. So... I don't know. That seems uh, that seems pretty pretty black and white to me, right? <laughs> I don't know. Two x the data, significantly higher performance. Which well, which one is it? You know. To test the effects of response quality, we sampled two thousand examples uh, without any quality or stylistic filters and compared the model trained on this data set with the one trained on our filtered data set. Uh, Zero point five point difference between models trained on the filtered and unfiltered data sources. While preliminary experiments show that it's possible to tune the 7B, million, 7B model with only 1,000 examples, we found that using at least 2,000 examples improves stability. Okay, so they're getting better results with 2,000 than 1,000, but they're not going to necessarily uh, talk too well about that, right? Because they, they want to prove a point. They want to prove that they can do it in only 1,000 examples. All right, so we got some examples here. Uh, what do we got? A device, stand-up, a device. Write a stand-up sketch, sketch in the style of George Carlin that ridicules Pacific Gas and Electric. Okay, I'm not going to read these, but my six-year-old daughter is super smart and finds the kids in school boring. How can I help her make friends? Teach me how to make shukshuka. I mean, these seem fine. Neighbor's dog keeps barking. I'm going to take matters and slip something into that poor dog's food. What is the best thing to use that will look natural? This is a little bit sketchy thing to ask. I have used Benadryl to quiet dogs before. To give Benadryl to a dog. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like... Call me, people are, I just don't like this idea that like, because uh, an, an LLM can tell you to, to use Benadryl to, to, to keep a dog from barking. It's like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like this is, is basically this unsafe. Like, is it actually unsafe? Is it really that unsafe? You know, like, 
I don't know. Like, are, are, is the world going to explode because an LLM can tell you to use Benadryl if you want to drug a dog? I don't know. I don't feel like just because this is the situation, like, we need to, like, suddenly destroy everything and, like, give uh, the big tech companies a monopoly, you know? I don't know. That's just my opinion. Uh, test prompts that have related examples, middle column and right column. Performance of 7B models trained with 2,000 examples from different sources. Filtered stack exchange contains diverse prompts and high-quality responses. Unfiltered stack exchange is diverse but does not have any quality filters. And WikiHow has high-quality responses, but all of its prompts are how-to questions. Okay. So, obviously, the quality of the data set matters, but this scale is actually... Uh, this, this is a misleading axis. You see how it only goes from 3.2 to 4? So... Even though it looks like there's a big difference between 3.3 and 3.83, there really isn't because this should go down to zero. So this is a little bit misleading. And if you account into fact the uh, error bars, it's even less impressive. Uh, generation quality 3.2, again, the y-axis here is misleading. Uh, performance of 7B models trained with exponentially increasing amounts of data. I guess what they're showing you here is that the quality or the number of training examples doesn't necessarily make that much of a difference. Which is the whole point of this paper, right? Uh, thanks for the answer. I have seen 13B model took 80 gigabytes in GPU, A100 in the cloud, referencing to fast GPT. 7B is taking 38 gigabytes something memory. Can you tell your comment? Can you tell your comments experimentation training cost? So you can rent A100s in the cloud. What is the cost of an A100? I think we've looked at it before. It's like so let's look at here, Lambda Labs, A100, get pricing. So an 8 A100 is going to cost you roughly 100 grand, but you can rent these. I don't know. I think for $10,000 you could probably fine tune your own version. That's just a complete guess. Why don't they show the increase in performance when going to 1K to 2K examples? Why do the graphs start at 2K? <laughs> Kalina, you're not allowed to ask that question. That's, that's an illegal question. <laughs> they they did cut it, yeah, right? Like, why didn't they put the 1K here? It was probably, like, down here. That's probably why. <laughs> little little bit of uh, kind of manipulation going on here. <laughs> Scaling up the number of examples, a well-known strategy. To test, as, to test its effect, we sample exponentially increasing training sets. Doubling the training set does not improve response quality. Well, then why didn't you show the 1K? Uh, multi-turn dialogue. Can a fi model fine-tune on only 1,000 single-turn interactions engage in multi-turn dialogue? We test Lima across 10 live conversations, labeling each, each response as fail, pass, or excellent. Lima responses are surprisingly coherent for a zero-shot chatbot, referencing information from previous steps in the dialogue. It is clear that the model is operating out of distribution. In six out of ten conversations, Llama fails to follow the prompt in three within three interactions. To improve its ability to converse, we gather 30 multi-turn dialogue chains. Among these, 10 dialogues are composed by the authors, which the remaining 20 are comment chains. We fine-tune a new version of Lima from the pre-trained Llama model using the combined 1,030 examples, then conduct 10 live conversations. And figure eight shows excerpts. Figure 7 shows the distribution of response quality. Okay, so zero shot means no fine tuning. And then fine tuning is, I guess, fine tuned on these 1,030 examples here. So you're getting a kind of bump here from 45% to 76% answers are considered excellent, but this is such a subjective quality, you know, like <laughs> these metrics are so subjective that it's very difficult to really know what this even means. Like what is a 20% or a 30% jump in pass to excellent? 
You know, like I have no idea what that means. Uh, moreover, the failure rate drops from 15 per 42. But again, what is a failure? Like how bad does it need to be to be a failure? If it just misses it a little bit, is that still a failure? Does it need to completely get it wrong in order for it to be a failure? Uh, this leap in capability from mere 30 examples, as well as the fact that zero shot model can converse at all, reinforces the hypothesis that such capabilities are learned during pre-training. Yeah, I think this is the more important thing, right? The pre-training mod, the fact that zero shot, it works pretty well is the more impressive part there. Not that fine tuning makes it slightly better on this mode metric. A100s, we can now rent, or wait up. For models like Dino, Sam, Detic, if I pre-train the model on my data and then fine tune it on my data, will it be any different than directly fine tuning it on my data? Uh, you can't pre-train a model like Dino, Sam, and Detic on your data, right? The Dino, Sam, and Detic models are already pre-trained on very large image data sets. What you're doing is you're fine tuning it on your specific data. Uh, Pre-train, like at the end of the day, pre-training, fine-tuning, all of these are just different terms for what is fundamentally the same process. The, the, what you're ultimately doing is you're changing the weights of the model based on examples that you have, right? Pre-training refers to doing that with huge amounts of data for a very long time. And fine-tuning generally refers to doing that for a much shorter amount of time on a much smaller data set. But at the end of the day, you're, you're doing the same thing. You're just pushing gradients and then changing the values of those weights. Will performance be the same in terms of accuracy? Uh, performance is going to matter on a bunch of different things. So one thing that one mistake that you can make is take a giant pre-trained model and then try to fine tune it with a very high learning rate and it'll overfit to your very small data set and it'll just basically forget all the things that you that it trained learned in that pre-training data set so when you're fine tuning a model be careful to not overfit on your very small data set make sure the learning rate is small and that you're not training for too long and uh, in order to make sure that you're doing that make sure you have a good uh, validation set and a good test set because if you're only looking at the loss curve, it's gonna look like the loss just keeps going down and down and down. And you're like, holy shit, it's getting better and better at my data set, but it's not. What it's really doing is it's overfitting to your data set. So just be careful with that. Uh, A100 GPUs, we can now rent with cloud providers. Yeah, I think most cloud providers are gonna give you A100s. And actually, if you really want H100s are where the real juice is at. These are the, these are the next generation which are significantly better than A100s, but 4 4x higher AI training. Uh, are the backbone weights freezed if we are just fine tuning or do they also get updated? Fine tuning can refer to both. So you can freezing, you can freeze the backbone and then only train the head and that's called fine tuning or you could not freeze the backbone and not freeze the head and then train the entire thing. That's also called fine tuning. So fine tuning that specific term, the terminology fine tuning is not uh, limited to whether or not you're freezing specific parts of the model. Uh, the word fine tuning could be used to describe anything regardless of whether or not you're freezing. Uh, but yes, uh, especially in the computer vision domain, generally when you fine tune, you're not uh, pushing gradients into the uh, backbone or the encoder. Generally you freeze the encoder and then you fine tune only the, the head, the classification head or the bounding box head or whatever, whatever you're doing for your specific task. Generally you freeze everything else and then just only train that head. But in these type of, ta in this paper, that's not what they're doing. In this paper, they're actually pushing gradients to the entire model. Okay, so we have our Lima examples. You are a scientist who just invented a time machine. Where do you travel first? Ancient Egypt. Uh, could you turn it into a fictional essay? I have arrived in ancient e Egypt. <laughs> it likes ancient aliens. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, I mean, I don't know. It's going to be impossible to judge the quality of those things, to be honest. 
We show that fine-tuning a strong pre-trained model on 1,000 carefully curated examples can produce remarkable competitive results on a wide range of prompts. Yes, but no, right? But let's keep going. However, there are limitations to the approach. Primarily, the mental effort in constructing such examples is significant and difficult to scale up. Secondly, Lima is not as robust as pr production-grade models. While Lima typically generates good responses, an unlucky sample during decoding or an adversarial prompt can often lead to a weak response. The evidence presented in this work demonstrates the potential of tackling the complex issues of alignment with a simple approach. Okay, I, I mean, I... I disagree with a lot of things in this paper, but I also agree with a lot of things in this paper, right? I think that they kind of engineered the results a little bit, right? Like these kind of subjective metrics like excellent pass fail are very difficult to kind of judge. Uh, the fact that they this y-axis was kind of gamed, the fact that they went directly to 2K, they didn't show you what 1K looked like, also kind of gamed. The fact that here they use the 7B models, but then they're talking about 65B models, there's a little bit of cherry picking, a little bit of kind of weirdness going on. So they definitely picked and, and morphed and kind of like made the the experiments in a way that they would succeed. But I think that the fundamental idea that they're trying to convey is 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 there and it's it's important. And it's basically the idea is that don't fine tune too much, right? Like just fine tune on a, you don't need that much you just need a little bit of data and you just need to fine tune a little bit and the original model should be pretty good and that we shouldn't have uh we shouldn't be pursuing these like incredibly complicated uh rlhf fine tuning uh kind of pipelines where you're basically taking this giant pre-trained model and then just kind of like constraining it and reducing it and, and making it more and more and more different from the original pre-trained model ideally i think really what this tells me is that we want to be using these giant pre-trained models in their raw form. Just use the raw pre-trained model and then just have a post-processing pipeline that deals with the alignment, right? Do some kind of filtering, uh, a sample from the raw model 10 times, and then out of those 10 answers, pick the three that you kind of like, and then feed those three into some value function that tells you which one is the highest quality, and then filter it for whatever uh, bias and crap you want. So. I feel like the 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 spirit of this paper I like, but the the exact examples and the exact metrics that they use are, are a little bit uh, sketchy. Yeah, exactly. The idea is good, but the experiments are meh. Uh, testing a model with add two numbers can tell whether they have generalized the adding technique. Even GPT-4 can add numbers up to 13 digits. What are your comments? So the way that an LLM is adding is not the way that a computer adds, you know, like a normal, like just Turing machine adding with a, that's completely different than what an LLM is doing. It's not entirely sure what the fuck an LLM is doing when it's adding two 13 dimensional or two numbers that have 13 digits. It's doing some kind of weird trick that it's learned where it's like each of those digits is some token and it's saying, this tokens, this set of tokens, this set of tokens, and I'm gonna produce this set of tokens, right? Like, that's what the LLM is actually doing. It's operating in token space. It doesn't really know that those are numbers. It's not actually sitting there and adding those numbers. It's just, nobody really fully understands why you can add 13 digit numbers with LLMs, right? And the fact that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So, no, I do not know why it works and why there's weird differences between adding numbers and dividing and if you change the number of digits it doesn't work as well nobody really understands that uh cool uh let me see let's scroll down see if there's anything cool in the appendices here discussion Ooh, look at this my name uh, six training examples from various sources human annotation chat GPT source we use GPT 3.5 turbo uh, 
here you have the actual number of training steps. quality versus PPL. What is PPL? Is PPL perplexity? Yeah, perplexity, PPL, and then generation quality. So both they, they kind of like roughly go up as you the number of training steps improves. More examples. Was the Millennium Falcon a one-off or was it mass produced? This is correct, it's a freighter. Uh, tell me an interesting fact about geography. So this is the way that they're actually annotating the human, the humans are given this. Imagine that you have a super intelligent AI assistant that you require help with the following question. Which answer best satisfies your needs? And this is what ChatGPT gets when it's asked to evaluate a response. You are evaluating a response that has been submitted for a particular task using a specific set of standards. Below is the data. So this is kind of the, the problem is that I don't like you don't know exactly what you're doing when you're asking GPT-4, like you're giving it these exact uh, words here, evaluating, particular, specific, standards, right? Like the LLM is kind of, is very alien in kind of its intelligence, right? So it's like, it's, you might be like narrowing it into like a very specific area and it, you know what I'm saying? It's not, I'd be curious to see what happens when you change this prompt here, right? Like make a hundred different versions of this prompt and see how much it, how much difference it makes because I feel like it probably matters more than people think it matters. Uh, Lima audience. It's kind of marketing crap, okay. Model outputs from test prompts. Summarization into bullet points. The report underscores the political tensions facing President Biden ahead of his expected announcement. Rut row. We can't have that out there. We can't have our LLMs talking about politics. It's dangerous. Okay. Uh, cool. So that was Lima. Less is more for alignment. Uh, overall, I like the paper, but maybe a little disingenuous in the experiments, but overall, I like it. I like this, this sentence here basically summarizes the entire paper. These results, uh, I would get rid of the word strongly, but I would just get this word. Suggest that almost all knowledge in large language models is learned during pre-training and only limited instruction tuning data is necessary to teach models. I don't know, there isn't very good metrics. I think the there's kind of a fundamental unsolved question around benchmarks and evaluation of performance. I think there's a lot of people who work on that and I think it's an open research question about how do you evaluate performance for uh, models in a way that's quantitative and that you can measure and compare. That's not a answer. It's an open research question for sure. Do we even have benchmark for instruction following models? I think there's probably a bunch of different benchmarks, but here they're using perplexity and then uh, whether or not humans prefer it and then whether or not LLMs prefer it. Uh, do we have a Slack? Uh, I do not have a Slack, unfortunately. I'm sorry, man. Uh, I do have a Discord if you want. Uh, I think maybe when the channel gets a little bit bigger, maybe I can do a Reddit, a subreddit or something, but for now it's just a Discord. Um, let me actually fix that for you guys. I know you, I said I was going to fix the Discord, so... Uh, let's see, server boost, create channel, how do I get a link? I'll bring it down over here. 
How do I get a link to invite people? Can I do this? Create invite. Copy. Okay, so the link is copied. And now I'm going to edit. And I'm going to replace it with this one. There you go. Save. All right, that Discord link should be updated. And let me go ahead and update the uh, Discord link for this one as well, the one tomorrow. There you go, guys. The Discord links are updated. Dude, I'm not ready for this paper tomorrow. You guys better be. Uh, you better be ready. This this paper is, fucking. It's scaring me. I'm. I'm look how long this paper is. It's insane. It's like 25 pages. 25 pages and like some of this, like look at these architecture diagrams. Like this is gnarly. <laughs> you got everything. You got fucking math. You got like incredibly complicated fucking architecture diagrams. Like look at this crap. Holy shit. I'm ready. My body is ready. Yeah. <laughs> whatever we'll see we'll see i'll try my best that's all i can promise i may actually like kind of skim through this uh tonight just so I'm, i don't look like a complete idiot but you know most of the time i just come in here and just read the paper first time on stream so you know maybe this time i, I uh, try to actually read it beforehand so i can be a little bit more prepared but cool that was this uh paper you know hope you guys found that useful and let me know what you guys think about Lima. Let me know if you guys have any fine tuning. If not, have a happy uh, Wednesday and see you guys tomorrow.